Today's episode of Social Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across Australia and the globe to train leaders, develop engagement strategies and empower people to organise for change. Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to make a difference, inspire, give hope and enable leadership to achieve their shared purpose. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left political and cultural podcast that dives into the progressive issues of the day and the people leading them from both home and abroad. Uh, On this week's episode, we speak with two former Labor Party secretaries of the Victorian branch of the Labor Party, David Feeney and Eric Locke. David being from the Labor right of our great organisation and Eric being from the Labor left. And I've deliberately brought those two people on to talk about the internal uh, reform debate that's going on within the Labor Party here in Victoria since the 60 Minutes program two weeks ago that highlighted systematic branch stacking and alleged a uh, number of various rules and things broken. On this week's episode, we are joined by two special guests, both former party secretaries of the Victorian branch of the Labor Party, uh, David Feeney and Eric Locke. Uh, David and Eric are joining us on this week's episode following the 60 Minutes report into systemic branch stacking inside the Labor Party here in Victoria and the fallout from it, which has presented a make or break moment for Labor here in Victoria. And David and Eric are going to be on today's episode to discuss how we go about bringing about both cultural and organisational change here in Victorian Labor now that the party has essentially been put on ice and the reins have been handed over to former Premier Steve Brax and former Federal Minister in Labor Governments, Jenny Macklin. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher. So if you're an Apple Podcast user, please leave us a rating and give us a review. And for all of the updates for every episode, just follow us on Dunn Street on our various socials, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Let's get to today's episode. Taping this one on a Friday afternoon in downtown Melbourne and uh, joining me on the line from various parts of the great city of Melbourne is the former party secretary of the Victorian branch of the Labor Party from 1999 to 2002, as well as a whole number of other illustrious positions within politics. David Feeney, welcome to welcome back, I should say, to Socially Democratic. And nice to be with you and thank you very much. Uh, and on the line as well uh, is the former party secretary of the Victorian Labor branch uh, as well, Eric Locke from 2003 to 2005. Eric, welcome to Socially Democratic. Thanks, Devin. Good to be here. So the inspiration to get both of you on to today's uh, podcast really does revolve around the um, the program that was aired on 60 Minutes two weeks ago uh, that lifted the lid on uh, and made a number of accusations about branch stacking um, in the Victorian branch of the Labor Party. And I thought that it would be uh, appropriate to get two former party officials of the Victorian branch onto the podcast today just to have a bit of a conversation about that. And I know that certainly the, 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 both the 60 Minutes program and the subsequent articles that have been written across all the different major papers here in Melbourne and nationally has got everyone in the Labor Party talking about the Victorian branch. And uh, I actually just wanted to bring two people on that have worked for the Victorian branch to talk a bit about what happened um, and really more reflect about where the party can go from here, because I feel like this could potentially be a watershed moment for our party, certainly in Victoria. And uh, I just wanted to see uh, what your thoughts were on what was reported on that Sunday night and also going forward where the party can go from here. And I, I guess I wanted to get your first reactions to the 60 Minutes uh, program um, going into it when we sort of, when Channel 9 first did the sort of the teaser for the program, Um, you know, we were wondering, is this just another traditional good old Sunday morning, um, Sunday program with Jim Whaley insight into some of the nefarious sides of um, Labor Party politics? Or was this going to be something a bit bigger? What were your thoughts going into it? And then your immediate reactions after digesting the 60 Minutes program? We'll start with you, uh, Eric. 
Uh, so coming into it, I, I really didn't know what to expect. Uh, there was, it, it would have to be, the build-up was so massive that I expected it to be fairly seismic. And it was seismic, but for me, it wasn't something that came as um, surprising. Uh, I and was perhaps surprised that somebody had been caught on tape paying for memberships, but that kind of itself doesn't strike me as unusual in the Victorian branch over the last 40 years. Um, so I was horrified for the brand of the party. Um, I've, all, I've thought consistently that the, um, the brand stacking in the Labor Party has been a problem, and I think I'm on the record about this for some 15 years. So um, I'm a known quantity in this regard. And I'm, I'm glad in a way that it happened so that it provides that seismic event to actually drive change. because so I think that's what we need, much as we got in the 70s. David Feeney, uh, your initial thoughts to the program? Yeah, I, I, I share those views. I think uh, the uh, what set the story apart from previous efforts was normally these stories are aggrieved party figures making a bunch of complaints about someone or a group and then that group, to some extent, defending itself, and it kind of ends up being a he said, she said, umpired by the journalist and whatever their biases might be. This was obviously different because here we had extensive video um, arising from the surveillance of Adam Somurek. And I I mean, the 60 Minutes format frustrated me in the sense that they had so much good material uh, that why they felt the need to get an actor and spoon feed the audience with dramatic music and reenactments. I, 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 I find that the, the, I found the format frustrating and unnecessarily salacious, particularly given the wealth of material they had, they just didn't need to burnish it up. But the story was obviously, well, to borrow your language, seismic and uh, its implications profound. Uh, I, I share Eric's view that this is um, potentially an enormous moment for the Victorian branch and consistent with that old adage, never waste a crisis. Um, this might be a moment where um, some terrific reform might be accomplished because of the dramatic nature of the intervention and because of um, the sort of sense of solidarity around the need for action. Um, the, I think the, the Victorian branch is actually presented with a moment of great opportunity. And we'll, uh, we'll dive into those opportunities that um, could present itself uh, in a moment. I, I just want to get your thoughts on... So Monday morning, uh, the Premier, Daniel Andrews, stands up in front of the media and uh, has a uh, press conference in which he swiftly sacks Adam Somerick from his ministry and calls on the national executive to um, remove him as a member of the Labor Party. And I think um, Somerick had um, resigned anyway before they had a chance, but... Um, did you think that um, that in that first sort of 24 to 48 hours that the Premier had handled this uh, crisis that it had exploded in his lap uh, on Sunday night? David? Yes. I mean, he had a few different lines of uh, action that he needed to manage, and he's managed them. He, he obviously had a media storm. Um, this was kind of the... The, the sexiest political story that there had been since COVID and isolation had dominated. So it immediately attracted hyper coverage from everybody. Uh, and Daniel needed to be cognizant of that and demonstrate leadership and that he was in control, dispel any notion that um, that was not the case or and that he was somehow um, able to be uh, influenced or in, um or even intimidated by figures inside the party. So he dispatched that. Uh, and then I think he said in, uh, together with the federal leader, Anthony Albanese, he set in place a structure that will enable, um, well, and, and hopefully realise, but we'll see, um, uh, for the party to move forward in a way where uh, there has been real change. I mean, the point's been made by many that We've been through lots and lots of reviews over the years as the parties wrestled with this challenge. Uh, and perhaps we can discuss later in the program what I think was flawed about those. Um, so I think, you know, they say weeks is a long time in politics and they're right. The Labor Party has been transformed in two weeks. But looking back on the last two weeks, you can say Daniel wrested control of the steering wheel, um, demonstrated that he was 
uh, in command of the Labor Party and its destiny, that his authority um, was strengthened rather than weakened by the crisis, um, and that he is in control of taking things forward. So uh, from uh, the perspective of the government and from the perspective of his uh, authority and prestige in government, I think he's come out of this enhanced. Eric, uh, your thoughts on that? Broadly, again, agree. Uh, so the headline should be Feeney and Locke agree on party reform. <laughs> um, which, you know, I will say that he didn't 15 years ago, but, you know, there you go, the passage of time. <laughs> Um, we the, all can mature. I think you're not um, you're not judged in crisis by the crisis itself, but by how you respond to it. And if we cast our minds back to Peter Beattie and the Shepherdson inquiry, Peter Beattie also, almost uh, would create a crisis of his own making in the run-up to each election and respond to it. Now, Daniel hasn't done that, obviously, but but being so divisive, uh, divisive, decisive in these in these moments, whether it be COVID brand stacking, um, any problem that has arisen for Daniel, he has the mark of a, a leader with some longevity. Uh, it makes him reasonably impervious to attack. If he if, if the first thing you, you admit is, this is wrong, I'm going to stop it. Now, if you just let these things bleed, it, they become impossible to cauterise. So I think the, the reaction was proportionate. I feel for some of the people involved. Uh, I feel for some of the young people involved who um, who hunt around and search for a leader. Um, I struggle to see how many of those people will find a way back into the labour party, and I think that's very sad for them. Mm. Um, and I think there are a couple of innocents that, that have been unfairly tarnished. However, in any event like this, um, everybody involved in the labour movement, and the labour party particularly, gets tainted with a bit of a stain, and Daniel has had to act quickly to try to uh, restore that. You both in your responses there raised uh, a couple of interesting points that I want to pick up on. And one of the words you used, uh, David, was intimidation um, inside the party. And there was a really interesting article that was in last week's Sunday Age by Chip Legrand, in which he detailed uh, Somerick's sort of manipulation of journalists and politicians and aides. Um, and in it, he sort of he accused Somerick of leaking against, you know, his own party, leaking against his own colleagues and undermining the Premier's leadership to newspapers like the Herald Sun and to the Liberal Party. Um, there was even a, a Labor source had suspected that it was Somerick and his supporters that had leaked the red shirts story or fed that to um, to various newspapers and to the Conservatives. Um, this intimidation that people in the caucus speak about and people in the party speak about that they never wanted to call out what actually was going on. What do you think that it just what I find interesting is that this has happened. There's been such uh, detail uh, recorded uh, both on camera and on audio. Um, you know, we don't know who did that or what their motivation was, but it's n noticeable that there's been all of this Im intimidation that's existed for quite some time, but now I feel like the lid has been lifted off. Um, you, what, I just want to get your, both of your comments to that. Starting with you, David. Well, I mean, I, I, I read Chip Legrand's article and uh, it's the first time a journalist um, has been willing and able to ventilate those issues, but I don't think those issues come as a surprise to anyone who's been uh, watching uh, and knowing the Labor Party in Victoria over the last several years. Um, that, that behaviour Chip talked about is not a shock um, and it's obviously been deeply frustrating uh, for for a long time now, that um, Adam and other characters associated with him um, have been able to procure that support from the Herald Sun. The Herald Sun, I think, has been pretty clear-eyed about its objective, which is to get Daniel Andrews, um, and they they make common cause with anyone and any issue that might, in any moment, assist them in that cause. Uh, but in some ways, that unattractive as it is, is something that um, all parties, including ours, need to uh, build structures and cultures around so that they can be fought and resisted. Uh, I, I think uh, the sort of behaviour talked about and described and videoed um, was a new low um, and has triggered an appropriate reaction. And um, as I said at the outset, um, hopefully will mean that there can be 
um, dramatic and long-lasting reform. But culture and structure are inextricably linked, um, and this is a chance to do something decisive uh, on both of those fronts. Um, and the sorts of behaviours that we saw on video and the sorts of um, protection rackets, media protection rackets, and the threat of media character assassination that has been engaged in um, is frankly anti-democratic. It's, it, you know, if, if you attack me, the Herald Sun's going to come get you. Mm. Um, it's good that that kind of uh, protection racket has been called out in the age. Um, and it's uh, good that people who have long understood this um, are now able to see that reported in the media and more widely understood. So the uh, administration of the Victorian branch of the party has now been handed over to former Premier Steve Brax and former Deputy Leader of the Federal Caucus, Jenny Macklin, uh, effectively suspending the party bodies in Victoria through to 2023, which means no state conference, no candidate pre-selection, no admin committees, which um, personally, if I was still a party official, I'd be very happy about that. Um, and uh, many have thought that this is a bit of overreach. Others have welcomed it. Uh, Eric, I want to get your thoughts on this uh, this move by effectively the national executive, but the direction of the premier. Yeah, look, I understand the rationale for it. I think it's a difficult sell to say that people should be disenfranchised because uh, for that long because of problems with our internal democracy. Um, the, the answer to a lack of internal democracy can't be an endless lack of democracy. Um, there are a bunch of people that did nothing wrong here. Um, so the sooner this audit is done, then we should be moving to having some having some involvement of the rank and file, and particularly unions who especially have done nothing wrong. We're going to have a situation where it's alleged that a number of these people, or a number of the people involved in grand stacking have put in place members of parliament um, around the place um, through means which are found to be um, inappropriate against the rules. And then those members of parliament are going to be re-pre-selected by the national executive without challenge on an undemocratic basis. Now, that's not quite right. That doesn't add up. Um, we shouldn't go on with the same leaders of the rotten boroughs who are elected by the rotten boroughs while we order the rotten borough. Mm. Um, it shouldn't take that long. If we can do it quickly, then we should be looking to get these people who are beneficiaries of this corrupt system out. David? I don't think it is an overreaction. I, I think part of the it, branch stacking and mass recruitment is an historical process and it's a continuum. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, there are branches that were stacked 25 or 30 years ago um, that are and, and have been... Um, strong um, voting blocks inside the Labor Party for, you know, long periods of time, 20, 30 years. Um, and over 20 or 30 years, they everyone's come to accept them and understand them and and, and factor them into, the, their, into their calculations. Uh, and then you have branch stacking of more recent times, which is more dramatic, more larger scale, disturbs the status quo and gets and creates enormous ripples uh, of anxiety across the Labor Party. Um, and no matter how deeply enmeshed or, ab or, or completely uninvolved one is in these processes, we've never had a situation where the Labor Party has been able to decisively deal with this because no one faction was ever willing or able to unilaterally disarm. Mm -hmm. um, and no politician, no matter how indirectly they benefited from these uh, factional votes inside the Labor Party, um, could afford to completely... Um, disaggregate themselves from it. So I guess my point is that um, for lasting reform, which so many ache for, can only be achieved if we're operating in an environment uh, where um, individual factions or individual groupings are not being defanged, but rather there's a level playing field of reform for everyone. And what um, Anthony Albanese and Daniel Andrews have set up here is that level playing field. Um, with Jenny Macklin and Steve Brax, there's two seasoned and respected operators who are um, emblematic of balance. Um, and they are now managing a situation where everyone is equal and you don't have to scurry around for votes. You don't have to scurry around um, confronted with the threat that 
your branch is going to be demobilized by the national executive while a rival branch survives and uh, overthrows you. So stripping away those anxieties, um, I guess wiping the slate clean of, of, of those power dynamics, which are real, I think is a critical ingredient to achieving lasting reform. Um, I accept the point that uh, a lot of people have been um, disenfranchised as a consequence, but I guess my point would be that um, for lasting reform, it's necessary, and those people are disenfranchised by the sort of balkanised labour environment they're in anyway. Mm. Well, they're disenfranchised at the moment, for sure, but I, I just, I would labour the point that I, I we're not going to get much, we're gonna, not going to get very far as a, as a party if we continue, our answer continues being to be to disenfranchise members who've done nothing wrong, and that's from the, the reforms that we had in the 90s through to now, we've gone from 80% um, union representation through to 50% um, membership representation in party forums. Um, and we've given more and more power to these groups. While we've disenfranchised branch members, we have to find a solution fairly quickly to enfranchise those people who have been long-serving branch members who've done nothing wrong. Three years is a long time. It's a very long time. It is, but I think we have to hasten slowly because what comes next needs to work and that means it needs to be carefully deliberated on and that's an interesting point that i want to, I want to run with because there has and you both have mentioned this in your earlier remarks there has been so many reviews done into branch stacking in victoria um, and they have a number of recommendations. Some of them are implemented. Many of them are not. Possibly one of my favorite reviews is the, what was then called the Simon Carley Review, but I actually would constantly refer to it admin as the Carly Simon Review, to which no one laughed, which proves my point about some of the people that are on admin. They lack humor. Anyway, the Carly Simon Review, like there's been so many of them. And it's got to the point where we were naming them after, you know, folk singers from the 1970s that it hasn't achieved enough. What do we, What does the party need to do from a review standpoint in terms of addressing the, the problems that we have and coming up with uh, rule changes that uh, do create this kind of circuit breaker? Like, I think the Premier referred to it as breaking the business model of the branch stackers. Well, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll jump in with, you know, a free assessment because as you both know, I'm always full of those. Um, I think all of those reviews have made the same mistake in different ways, and that is that they have all focused on how to make joining the Labor Party and remaining in the Labor Party an ever more complex and fraught undertaking. And the rules have become so complicated um, and so punitive that in order to join the Labor Party, increasingly one needed the help of uh, you know, a recruitment agent steeped in the arcane ways of the Labor Party. And so by building the walls ever higher, the only people who knew how to find their way into the Labor Party were very often um, factional operatives and professionals who, who could. And so rather than opening the Labor Party up, we in fact have progressively shut it down so that only factional operatives have had the will and the persistence um, to uh, actually find pathways for people into the party. Um, so those reviews where implemented in my judgment have generally made things worse rather than better. Eric, what's, yeah. what's your thoughts on that? Totally agree. Uh, so David and I have discussed this previously um, and we've lived through the every review since the Dreyfus review and every review has made it more difficult, more onerous and in many cases more expensive to join the Labor Party. Um, it has put hurdles in the play, in in uh, place for ordinary people wanting to get in, and the trick to um, the, the the experiment that we've never been bold enough to undertake is to throw the doors open to the great Australian public and become a true membership party. Thirty-five or seventy percent of the population can be um, can be relied on to vote Labor. Half of those are probably trade unionists. Throw the door open to them. Why shouldn't members of affiliated unions be given the right, whether they exercise it or not, to vote in press elections? That in itself makes branch stacking impossible because in Victoria alone, you would enfranchise 500 or 600,000 people. Mm. Now, the Victorian branch membership stack, though it may be, is only 16,000. 
It would make it function functionally impossible. It would mobilise the labour movement. It would bring in a real contest. Um, so those are the ideas we've never experimented with. When I was state secretary, there was a there was a paper that went up um, to offer forty dollar flat memberships in an un, in unwinnable electorates, basically. Mm -hmm. And it made it all the way to admin, and of course, it died because I stopped being state secretary, mate. But um, but where all good ideas go to die, the Victorian. <laughs> that's one. right. Um, so yeah, the the idea died with its author. But that kind of thing is worth examining again. It was forty dollars flat membership, twenty dollars for a member of an affiliate who just wanted to vote. The proof of this, I think, is in your work, frankly, Stephen. Uh, I mean the. The only way the Labor Party in, could embrace modernity uh, and build the structures and people we needed was to go completely outside the structure with something like Community Action Network. Mm -hmm. um, so there was the Labor Party accomplishing all it needed to accomplish um, and ignoring its own rule book by building and mobilising people who couldn't be members of the Labor Party because that was just too hard and too fraught. Yeah. Um, in any normal political party, the tens of thousands of people you found through that process um, would have been with us forever as members thereafter. But in our unique organisation, that was impossible. I, is that, I mean, I think, Stephen, you've built a framework here that we should look, you know, look to for the future. But we just need to be a little careful that we don't end up with Jeremy Corbyn as a result of this. So the barriers to entry, there still has to be a barrier to entry in that you have to have proven labour credentials so you don't allow surrogates. Um, but you don't want to go so far that we end up where we are. We are we are at the far end of a spectrum, and the British Labor Party is at the far other. And somewhere in the middle is the answer, I think. Spot on. And all pathways have risks. Um, the primary system, which we often reach to when we're searching uh, for the for, for the solution, does have a risk of introducing money politics into our internal processes. So we need to be alive to that. And I guess in terms of union members having a vote, I'm not against the idea, but I am reminded of my Labor history. And in the 1930s and 1940s, um, union secretaries did issue thousands of tickets to people so they could turn up and vote. The secretary of the boot trades would be at the pub around the corner from the polling booth handing out boot trades tickets. Um, so every system has its challenges. This is why we need time. This is why we need to proceed prudently, um, but we do need to search for the future. We're not going to find the future um, in our existing branch structure. The no problem, there was no problem with running trials either. Like we tried a trial in Kilsyth. It was held up as not a great success, but uh, we should, um, because it was the way it was administered, I think, more than anything. Yes. Uh, we should um, we should look to that. We should not be afraid to fail because we're already, already at a point of failure as a membership organisation. Yeah, it's interesting that, I mean, you're right there, the, those trials sometimes, uh, trialling is a great idea and uh, the Kilsyth one, when they, it's for, the, for the viewers at home that don't know what we're talking about, the Victorian branch trialled a primary system to pre-select a Labor candidate for the state seat of Kilsyth and it was then deemed to have been a bad experiment and we've never revisited it again. And I was actually... I think I'd just gone on to either campaign committee or I'd just gone on to party officers or one of those bodies when that trial was going on. Um, and the way it was set up to fail from, from the get-go. Um, and I think there was a real lack of experience and understanding about how primaries in the United States works. Um, and to shift to a primary model is going to take a cultural change, both from the party administration perspective, but also from the voting public perspective. Mm. Uh, citizens are not used to having a say in a, you know, internal political um, uh, selection process. Whereas in the United States, there certainly has been a bit more of a culture of that. So to just set up something for 20 minutes and say it didn't work and then shut it down again, I think was um, a bit unfair on the people that were coming up with that idea. And I th so I, I, th I think the lesson from that is that all of the things that we seek to do, you know, you guys noted the Community Action Network um, as, a, as a model as well. Um, you know, when we first introduced that in the 2013 federal campaign, there were we rolled it out in across 10 seats, but it, there was only two or three campaigns that kind of embraced it. But we really put a lot of time and energy into making sure that those two or three seats were a success and used that as a model going forward. And we deliberately took Daniel Andrews down to those campaigns to say, this is what it looks like if you embrace it. 
So it took three, four, five electoral cycles before people actually accepted that, you know, community organising or grassroots organising is, is an important part of our campaign strategy and our campaign culture. Um, if we were to apply the Kilsoft model to the CAN model, then it, wouldn't have, it would never have gone up. But it became part of our campaign culture. It hasn't become part of the internal life of the Labor Party. Correct. And deliberately so. In fact, when we first set up the, when we started employing staff, um, I, you know, I took it upon myself to stress to all of the field organisers that were getting employed or anyone getting employed within the field program that if you did happen to have any factional allegiances or any activities within any sort of factional or internal party bodies that you needed to check them at the door that for the next 12 months whilst you're working for the Victorian branch of the Australian Labor Party your commitment was to electing Labor Party candidates and nothing else you do not have time to attend POSC or to attend um uh, you know, internal factional meetings, your dedication has to be to uh, field organising and to the volunteers and the volunteer leaders within your campaign. And everyone embraced that. And I think it, it's it's a culture that's now embedded in field. The people start to look at you a bit funny if you are maybe fiddling around with some of that stuff. Um, and I think it's... Uh, we, we, you know, yeah, we... but I think to call that out though, Stephen, I think you were obliged to do that so that you didn't arouse the paranoias and fears of the Labor Party. Correct. More than anything else, because then you're license to build can might have been at risk um so i i think divorcing all of those people from the internal life of the labor party was a necessary step i'm not sure it was a desirable one yeah um i mean that's a good point and i you know it got to the point at some stage, once it started to really become a success after the 2014 campaign, in which at Admin, I was getting suspicious questions from both the left and the right about are these field organisers joining people up to the Labor Party? And I had to deny that they were, and they weren't. We instructed them not to do that. But yeah. how ridiculous is that, that a party official for the Labor Party, whose part of his job is to grow our membership, is actually telling factional hacks on Admin that, no, I'm not joining them up to the Labor Party. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think this goes to our big stru structural challenge, and that is that the Labor Party structure was built to facilitate campaigning um, and uh, developing people for an electoral environment 100 years ago. And in today's world, our structure is not building the people or, or promoting and incentivizing the skills development that you need for a modern campaign. And so this there's been this divorce between the sorts of behaviours and people who've done well in the organisational wing and the sorts of people and behaviours that win you elections. We, in fact, need a structure that brings them together. That won't always be a comfortable or happy process because some of the things you need to do to win modern campaigns, um, you know, are not entirely virtuous. They're banal. It's, you know, virtue signalling nonsense that goes on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that... Um, we have a party structure that is building the wrong skills and incentivizing the wrong behaviors. Um, and we need to find our way through that challenge. Um, and we can do that now in an environment where all sides have been forcibly disarmed um, and we can consider the future without fear or favor. So Eric, here's a question I'm going to put to you then because David picks up an interesting point there and it's a, something that's been rolling around in my head for a couple of weeks now is that, the Victorian branch of the Labor Party on a campaign front is now regarded as the gold standard of political campaigning amongst the Labor Party in Victoria, which is a great achievement to consider that in the 1980s, everyone thought that, that it was New South Wales. And it's run by the best people and we're regarded as being the leaders in that. Our Daniel Andrews government is run by the best people um, and are regarded as the most successful social democratic government amongst its contemporaries right now. However, the administrative... Well, that's our view and we're sticking to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right? I know. Once it's set on social democratic, it is now fact. <laughs> However, the administration side of the party that David is speaking about, um, we don't have people from interstate coming in and saying, teach us, show us how you're doing this. How... We, if we you probably were... get people from um, failed, uh, failed dictatorships coming in. <laughs> So you're so Eric. You're, you just all of a sudden you've been reappointed as the branch secretary. <laughs> Where do you start to lift the bar? Look, look. So there's, David's right to this extent. There's something has to be done to bring it back to um, 
point zero in Victoria because I mean the Victorian branch, just to correct the record, was really at its peak between nineteen ninety nine <laughs> and two thousand and five. Too shy. Um, but in all seriousness, when I was state secretary, we had um, party officials involved in uh, facilitating uh, you know, recruitment and membership payments and all of that kind of stuff, and that was a known. Um, and that flowed right through to the party machine out in the burbs and this may make some uncom people uncomfortable, but yes, I knew about that, right? Um, now, that needs a reset. So the party administration, increasingly since the 70s, has, since the last national intervention, has drifted back to how it was then, which is the people in party office helping facilitate their own factions run the show. And that previously was, you know, partly back in the 70s, and, and Claire is not that, and nor is our previous state secretaries, but the party machines are very much entrenched in state office. And if their job is campaigning, then that should be their job. Um, the administration should be run with a degree of virtue and separate from that. Um, and look, I'd just also make this other point that David touched on, that party structures aren't set up for modern campaigning. Modern campaigning, as you know, Stephen, has became, become very much issues-based and people will choose an issue time by time. Um, we, don't, we don't provide an option for people to opt in on issues that has ever proved effective, like the Labor Environment Action Network is you know, basically still a prison-like structure within the Labor Party. We need to facilitate people to be able to take actions in tiers in the Labor Party, not just join, go through some awful and protracted membership process get frustrated by the membership committee, get chucked out at admin, reapply. It's <laughs> ridiculous. You should be able to join, you should be able to join online for, you know, for $40. It is, and we, we are not even at that point as a modern political party. It is farcical. You can pay $700 to a union, right? And join online now. And they don't, uh, they don't ask the level of detail or put you through the level of hoops that the Labor Party does now. And it's, it's become, the, the Labor Party brand structure has been, become such that it is set up to protect itself from new entries. That needs to be brought below and apart, and hopefully that happens now. I guess I'd add to that, that I think our factional structures have decayed too, in the sense that, um, I, I remember when I joined the Labor Party, the big complaint was that there were two great factions, the left and the right, um, and that they, these were sort of, stullifying debate and had too much power and control over the internal life of the Labor Party. Well, in more recent years, we achieved the sort of democratic nirvana that independents 20 years ago wanted. We had, you know, up to a dozen factions. Um, and irrespective of their left or right branding and heritage, those 12 factions were all merrily engaging with each other in a shifting set of alliances. And that balkanisation, I think, means that, in fact, we have seen... Um, a decline in the quality of candidates who were being put forward. And, and I, th I, I think that this intervention might have taken place at a moment where we can arrest that before those chickens actually come home to roost. But um, because the, you, you said, Stephen, you know, that the quality of our people in the parliament, our quality of the people in the organisation is good, and that's absolutely right. I do think there was a risk to that going forward. Um, that this intervention uh, may have arrested because um, that sort of smaller scale, um, more shifting, um, more intensive balkanised factional environment, I don't think was conducive um, necessarily, not always, but necessarily to the pre-selection of good people. Whereas when there were larger factions, um, while they had lots of bad characteristics, they were more... They, they could be characterised as benevolent dictatorships compared to current structures, and they did put people into parliament um, who were of ca capacity, notwithstanding the fact that they had you know, factional allegiances and you know, the other people were not overlooked because they weren't in a faction and all of that stuff, which goes on. Um, the fact the two major factions were under constant pressure to put talent into the parliament so they could win. Um, and these much smaller contemporary factions did not feel that same pressure in my judgment. Um, and um, as I say, this intervention might have uh, taken place at a moment in time where um, the unhappy fruits of that um, won't be realised. 
It's uh, now that you've mentioned the uh, almost elephant in the room, which is the the, the F word factions. Um, in my travels uh, across various parts of the uh, the Western world and meeting people from other social democratic parties, they are all they know about the Australian Labor Party and its factions, and they're intri- <laughs> they're intrigued by it because it's something that they just don't have, um, and you know. Factions served a purpose, I guess, in herding of various opinions across this sort of ideological broad church that we always speak of. But I wonder in 2020, um, are, are we actually a broad church of ideas anymore? Like, is there really much difference in ideology between the left and the right? And I mean, I know that we haven't gone into a policy debate right now, but, you know, here we have a former secretary um, from the left and a former secretary of the right. And you guys are in furious agreement of certainly how the party should be run. Um, and I know that... Um, you know, in my own experience as a younger um, political apparatchik who was doing factional work, and I didn't actually, I, I didn't really have any friends who were in the other part of the party. And, and the same could be said of the other group. And it's only when I became a party official and I started to work with people from various aspects of the party that I built these intentional relationships and uh, got to know those people. And it's only when I, just, when I got to know those people more... Um, uh, more intentionally, I realized that we, by and large, actually agree on most things. We're not going to agree on everything, but we agree on most things. And I think in 2020, the way that the party's ideolo- ideology has changed, I'm starting to question, is there a need, do, do factions need to rebrand themselves? Or do they, do they need to, is it, do, does there need to be some sort of uh, uh, re- revision of their role within, within our organization? How do they play a part in trying to reform this? this shit fight that we're having right now? Well, I, I just, I guess, to answer your question, I'm going to pick up on David's answer, which is there's been this balkanisation of, of factions, so it's very hard to see the current factional structure such as it is, as it is playing a useful role because... We could map it, but it would change in a week. Yeah, it does change in a week, and that's been unhelpful. The two large factions that promoted people through their ranks with a degree of merit, people like like David and myself and yourself, Stephen, um, got promoted over a long period of time and through performance. But now, because there's these dozen groups and there are and allegiance, <laughs> to be fair, and allegiance, yeah, and um, there are little fiefdoms attached to a number of these groups, and they become of growing importance as you're trying to stitch together fifty percent. So, I would just differ on this point to a minor degree that I think there has been a growth in people being represented in parliament, particularly, who are being rewarded for the um, for the establishment of those fiefdoms in the last 20 years or so. I think that's been a growing trend and that kind of has to stop. So people who will um, till the soil tend to get rewarded. And I don't think that's, you shouldn't be trading seats in parliament for that kind of, uh, in that kind of ruthless way. Um, so it's hard to see the factions as they are to me, providing a useful role, and hopefully, um, Daniel has sufficient gravitas. Well, he does have sufficient gravitas to, to pull this forward. The two people doing the review have sufficient gra- gravitas as well. And from there, if, there will be some kind of realignment and re-establishment of the of the factional groups. I would hope. I think part of the issue here is that the ideological landscape has actually just become so much more complicated. Um, in the olden days, when I joined the right, we were very clear about the fact that, you know, we supported NATO and the socialist left supported the Warsaw Pact, and we're on different sides of the Cold War, and there was almost a global architecture to our ideological um, predilections. Um, and, you know, the socialist left were socialists, and not many of them are anymore, and, 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 and there, was, there were these issues, but of course, for the last 20 years, those issues have disappeared and been replaced by a far more complicated issues agenda. Um, and that more complicated issues agenda means that people inside the left and people inside the right often agreed with one another and disagreed with people inside their own churches. So to take my experience in the right, um, there were lots of people inside the right to, against whom I was more socially progressive but who were factional colleagues. And there were lots of people inside the right who were more economically um, conservative um, 
conservative is the wrong word there, but we, sort of neoliberals versus traditionalists. And factions no longer had the architecture to understand or constrain these debates. Um, and you can pick anything you like, whether it be um, social movements like feminism and environmentalism or um, contemporary political debates around uh, marriage equality or um, debt finance in state government, whatever it is, you'll, you'll find people on the left and people on the right who come together against others on left and right because they hold different views. So in this more complicated, swirling policy environment, um, left and right um, have lost their ideological resonance and become increasingly just organisational tools. Um, and then with factional balkanisation, they haven't even been very good at that anymore. So the ideological landscape being more complicated, it's also more complicated for the people who we want to have vote for us. Uh, and we can't lose sight of that either. We need to have a structure that comprehends that too. So uh, for better or worse, um, our factional structure is not designed for the complicated political and public policy discourse that we have now and are going to increasingly have. Eric, your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, they've become increasingly a coalition of self-interest, basically, um, with a bunch of groups being stitched together to, till they get to 50%. And they've, since the 90s, really, no group has managed to stitch that, that together for any long period of time, because it's always blown apart, because it's relying on, you know, one regional warlord and um, two small unions and the people the of the alliance of the Judean people's front. Yeah, and it becomes a complete mess. And look, for the for the record as well, David and I agree on policy matters as well. By and large, mm. if um, if I was given a, a choice of a faction to join these days, starting out, I I would be stuck. I, I'm still very much a union movement person, I suppose. So I would be guided by where my union was, but uh, it it'd be very tough these days. Uh, back in the day where, um, you know, I was the son of a feminist in Western Australia who Joe Bullock despised. It was a very easy choice, right? Um, I believed in women's right to work and, and their reproductive rights and in, and in gay rights. Um, and our opponents in the party just didn't. It was very easy. Now it's, it's a complete uh, technicolour um, raincoat that you have to kind of look at. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, it's not possible for a factional policy offering um, to encompass all of the views in its own ranks, let alone all the views in um, the party as a whole, um, because they are so diverse. Um, and that diversity of views, I, I, I mean, even in critical moments like leadership challenges, and unfortunately, as an MP, I experienced a few of those, yeah, there was a constellation of left and right figures on one side and a constellation of left and right figures on the other. In fact, the left and right branding meant nothing. It, it was people and how they saw the future of the Labor Party and their own uh, viewpoints. That it, it, In a lot of critical moments, um, factions have already completely lost their resonance. And in Canberra, around leadership challenges, um, that was that's one glaring um, example. But every major policy discussion in the federal parliamentary Labor Party that I was a part of, um, factional alignment meant absolutely nothing. The expression turkeys don't vote for Christmas comes to mind when I think about if you were to get all the factional heads or the people that claim that they have the power within the Labor Party together and say, how do we, how do we restructure this? Because I don't think you can do, I don't think you can bring about change without bringing them with you. Do you, Eric, do you agree with that? Well, there'll be significantly diminished power groups, I suppose, mate. So um, there will be smaller groups with self-interest in that room, I would hope. So you would think that the people that uh, Adam's group were broadly organising will be smaller, so there's more chance of change that might infringe on his perceived rights, and that should happen across the board for people who've been involved in this kind of activity. So that's the hope for change, I think. And do you, do you, do you think that these groups become smaller by virtue of a very successful audit of our branch membership by um, Steve Brax and, and Jenny Macklin, in which we then actually start to realise exactly who are our bona fide rank-and-file members? 
and I know where you're going with this, um, that there's never been a successful audit of the branch membership in Victoria, and I've seen a few of them um, done by such luminaries as Garth Head in the past. Um, and it, it discovered, and they discovered that four people, four people in an electorate of 1,040 that has gone from 200 to 1,040 in three years were found to be dodgy. Um, so I think the, the, the thing about this branch audit is it's being conducted by Jenny Macklin and Steve Pratt, and they will not take instructions from anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's the important difference. I've overseen audits of membership, as has David, I'm sure, where it was conducted by factional operatives. This is the first time that it's been done, or it's been done by people who aren't factional operatives. Uh, David spoke before about making it harder to join the party is creating a part of the problem. And I think, Eric, you were um, in furious agreement with that. And I am too, sat through a number of admins over the p past six years and watched members sit in um, in being held over for longer than my MCC membership is currently being held over for. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's been a number of suggestions at party rules conferences to... to to try and attack branch stackers, but David makes a point about, you know, let's not make it too punitive or too difficult to join the party. I just want to float a couple of suggestions that's sort of been thrown around the party at the moment, and that is one of them is um, no cash payments for membership, only uh, credit only credit card uh, payments for membership, but not sort of dodgy Aussie Post debit cards that you can go buy that don't have your name on it, but actually is the David Feeney, or gift cards, I think. Yeah, you might have said. yeah, gift cards. It has yeah. to be on the David Feeney credit card. Has to, you know must, <laughs> must be on the David Feeney credit card. That's a party I want to join. <laughs> I think Stephen's idea is everyone has their own credit card. Oh, yes. it's yes. so sad. Yeah. Sorry to rain on your parade. Yeah, Eric, you spoke <laughs> slightly too soon there. I was going to do a really shit joke about a David Kenny, uh, David Feeney black platinum uh, credit card that I'm sure that David has. Um, also, I reckon if ten thousand people renew on my credit card, someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, perhaps they wouldn't. That's the problem. Well, and think about the points you'll get for a you know business flight to Europe. Um, well, the modern environment, Stephen. I couldn't even fly to Wollongong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we done. Um, uh, so that that was the first uh, suggestion that's been put forward. The second one is uh, rolling renewal dates, as it stands, as you all know right now, that you all have to renew by uh, a date in March. And in this case, you renew twelve months after you've joined the party, therefore making it harder for the, the sort of the factional operatives to do bulk renewals all in one season. The third one was also eliminating local branch secretary bulk renewals. So the old tradition was, as we all know, that if you were the branch secretary, you, within the rules, were able to collect cash from your branch members and take it down to party office and do the renewals for them in bulk. Now, that made sense in the 1970s when not everyone could make a trip to Melbourne, to the city, to King Street or to Drummond Street or wherever it was in those days. But In, in the 1970s, we had 7,000 party members. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I noticed during renewals that people, branch checkers will rock up with absolute wads of cash that may be for bona fide members and may not be for bona fide members. But the point is, is that it's one of the key ways in which uh, branch stacking is getting around it. Because once you're in, it's now easy just to renew them. Um, what are your thoughts? Is that too punitive to the point you said before, David? Or is this some, is this a, some of the serious uh, uh, rules reform that the party has to consider or Brax and... Um, Macklin have to consider. Well, my, my initial reaction is that I, you're getting to that sounds too same same to me. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is that what we have here is an opportunity to reimagine the Labor Party and how it's organised. Now, the intervention in the 1970 um, brought about the first introduction of proportional representation, and what came with that was a transformation in the internal democratic life of the Labor Party. It kind of defanged the old Victorian central executive um, and uh, made the Labor Party a, a larger, more diverse, more democratic entity. Uh, I think this opportunity for a refresh means that we need to start with a blank piece of paper. And rather than agonising over the question of how we renew, let's think, well, what if, if we're starting with a blank piece of paper, what do, would you want this organisation to look like? What does it have to accomplish? What are its key goals? Uh, what, what sort of skills and people does it need to bring and 
grow? And how do we um, organise around that principle? Um, and let's go and ask other organisations that are similar, but no doubt different, um, about what innovations and systems they might be using. Um, and, and do this thoroughly and properly. Because if at the end of this review, all we have is um, a different way of renewing and rolling renewal dates and some of that stuff, then um, I for one will be unexcited. Um, and I think this is a chance for us to literally start again and reboot. Um, and for us to do that in a climate where people don't need to be anxious about their pre-selections or their futures or their factional power or whatever, um, but rather um, a level playing field where we can start again and design something new and different. And it might look very different to the past. And it might look very different to other state branches. But by the end of the 1970 intervention, the Victorian branch did look different from its parts and it did look very different to other state branches. Um, so let's not be frightened of that. We've, we've been great rules innovators in Victoria. I always used to make the joke that um, after we've implemented a rule in Victoria and worked out it doesn't work, it's adopted by every other state. Um, so um, let's think very creatively about what we can do and why we should be doing it. Um, for instance, I, I, the idea that every FEA has 10 or more branches um, facilitates an environment where you don't ever have to talk to people who disagree with you and you don't meet people across the party. Eat, factions have their own branches. Um, those silos should be wiped out. Um, and I'd be attracted to the idea where there is one branch per state electorate or whatever it might be, um, and party members of all colours and types are forced to mingle and debate and talk. Um, that, I think of itself, would engender um, a higher standard of um, debate and engagement and recruitment and make for a more lively and exciting internal culture. Where at the moment, branches are, uh, you know, meetings exclusively of the People's Front of Judea, and if you go to the wrong branch meeting, you'll find yourself at a different faction meeting and, 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 and that has contributed to the withering and ossification of our branch structure. So let's open it up, let's force people to mix, let's force a little bit of um, a debate of ideas, a bit of competition um, and uh, let's build the people and the skills we need to succeed in the modern political environment. Eric, I want to get your thoughts on that, but I just want to inject the word trust into that conversation as well, because I just think that's an important thing going forward for the people who get around that table and actually start to really talk about genuine reform of the party. There needs to be a level of trust between each other, because I just feel that certainly as a party official over the six years working there, when I started doing the Community Action Network thing, there was a lot of distrust towards what are Stephen Donnelly's ulterior motives here? And there wasn't any ulterior motives. I genuinely just wanted to build a grassroots movement that made us um, a, uh, an organisation that was going to win elections and get our people elected. But there was a distrust towards me. How do we overcome that as well? Well, they probably would. You know, you're, a, you're a unicorn, Stephen. They were probably like, who is this guy and what's wrong with him? Uh, <laughs> Why isn't he ambitious and trying to manipulate the Labor Party like the rest of them? <laughs> is he in the right party? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, um, to David's point, those were all recommendations of the Griffin Review. <laughs> so, um, yet another review and a, and a very worthy one, um, which uh, should have been enacted back then, but just didn't because it would have disrupted existing power structures. With those power structures now fractured, we have a chance. Uh, for what it's worth, David, I think your ideas are eminently sensible, but also David's ideas are eminently sensible in that we had we've had numerous recommendations encouraging people to have online branch meetings to have means of engaging that aren't the traditional meeting where you front up somewhere. And you know what, after 30 years, how many recommendations of the Hawk Rand Review have we enacted? 20 years, sorry. Three. And they're all about lessening powers of unions. Right? It is absolute, like, you know, just allowing people to engage without having to physically attend a branch meeting which was run by one of their factional peers 10 kilometres away is a, is a basic start. So reimagining how we engage with our membership has to be really at the, at the, at the core of this. And uh, Denny and Steve can design that system, I think, with a degree of in, integrity and distance from the fractured power structures that currently exist. Uh, final thoughts, gentlemen, before we uh, call it quits. David? Um, well, notwithstanding all of the... Um, 
sort of grim moments that there have been over the last fortnight and to echo Eric's point about you know some decent people having been shot in the crossfire um, the principle of never waste a crisis I think this is a moment of great opportunity for the Victorian branch and um, hopefully the Labor Party will come out of this experience as a renewed and stronger political organisation, better structured um, to deal with and thrive in the contemporary political environment than it is at the moment. Eric. Yeah, I look, I share those views of David's. I think, though, um, we have to start with the what's achievable here as well um, and start with the basics of how do we re-engage with genuine members properly and we sort out who are genuine members and let them design the system as well a bit from the from the grassroots up. We've got a, we've come a long way to be distant from that, so distant from those people that the people are allowed to sanction this kind of behaviour that we've witnessed on 60 Minutes and that we become, uh, you know, normalised to it, desensitised to it. Um, so uh, David and I share these views, but we're probably not the right people to talk to in isolation as clever as we are. <laughs> so probably there needs to be a bunch of research done by people in uh, positions such as yours, Stephen. And um, there are a bunch of learnings from the union movement, the Greens, community groups, about how they design their organisations in a modern setting. And we should look to engage experts to try to engage, to, to see what's working in engagement with people at a lower level and through the tiers of the party. Yes, um, it's a, a really good point, and I know we can probably go on for hours about this, but the other thing I just thought about was the, the lack of training and development of our leaders, and by leaders I don't mean leaders of, um, of, of the party itself or, or politicians, but leaders in local community levels as well. We, you know, When you get appointed as a branch secretary, that's it. No one actually gives you leadership skills on how to develop um, strategies, how to build relationships with people, how to engage with people outside of your own sort of strong ties. Um, one of the strengths of the Community Action Network was it was built on a model of ena enabling leadership and getting those leaders to work as teams and develop but their this strategies. This goes to both structure and culture. You don't mm. need any of those skills to be a successful branch secretary in the Labor Party, but you do need those skills if you're going to knock on people's doors and change their minds about a policy, a matter of substance. So... Um, advocacy means you, someone needs to know their own argument before they can advocate it, and they need a certain set of skills um, in order to convey that argument. And for too long, we've had a party structure where that skill set wasn't needed. Yeah, look, I hate to make this drag on forever, but in most modern organisations that are, you know, successful membership-run organisations, um, it's very hard to run them by committee these days. CEOs need to be empowered to run these organisations. They can lose their job if they're not being run effectively. But effectively, over time, what we've had is our state secretaries and campaign directors being held, being hostage to fiefdoms within the party. The separation of those two key functions, winning campaigns and running the organisation, will surely go a long way to solving some of our cultural problems over time. Well, let's handball it to... Um... Steve Brax and Jenny Macklin to sort out for us, shall we? Um, and I did notice there's... That's my phone number anyway. They can watch this if they're interested. I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> the... How do you use this? Yeah. Um, just a note to any party members listening to this podcast, um, there certainly was an email that went out last week um, from Steve and Jenny calling on, uh, not outlining the steps yet, but certainly they have indicated that there will be plenty of opportunity for members of the party to uh, make a contribution to how we reshape our great organisation. So please be on the lookout for that and use your voice because this is a critical moment for our party as I think we've outlaid in the last hour. David Feeney, Eric Locke, both to you. Thank you very much for your contribution to today's podcast. Um, Lovely to talk with you both. Lovely to talk to you both. And uh, we'll uh, maybe touch base with you in the near future to see how we've progressed. Yeah, well, and we negotiated how... the movie rights for this. Um... <laughs> I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> We're like a continuum of the same person, except I'm more handsome. But yeah, that's entirely arguable. And less <laughs> hair. Uh, I don't know about that, David. Lean forward. <laughs> 
I will point out this is just an audio medium, but sure. I'm glad you, I'm glad you dressed up in a tuxedo for this today, Eric. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're, you're going to be looks very training. bold. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. Thanks, guys. See you, Thanks, guys. guys. See you. Bye-bye.